Well, I've had the privilege in my lifetime of traveling to 30 countries on six continents. And one of the things that's always amazed me as I've traveled to countries around the world, in particular third world countries, are the amount of counterfeits that you will find throughout the world today. In fact, uh, about 10 years ago, I was over in China uh, doing some mission work, and some missionary friends of ours took us to an underground black market in China. And uh, when I say this was an underground market, it was literally underground. I mean, you had to like, go down like hundreds of feet of steps to get downstairs below this huge skyscraper to this underground black market. And I kid you not, it opened up as far as the eye could see into this mall, shop after shop after shop of full of black market counterfeit goods. I mean, this is just one small example. You had, you know, coach bags and Louis Vuitton and Rolex watches, Air Jordan tennis shoes, Levi jeans. I mean, you name it, anything you could imagine, you can buy a counterfeit of over in China. And uh, the same holds true almost anywhere you go in the world, especially in many of the third world countries. Markets like these are all over the place filled with counterfeit products. We, we, we live in a world today full of counterfeits. See, whenever you find something of great value, you're going to find a counterfeit for that thing. And the same is true when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our world is full of counterfeit gospels and false Jesus Christ. Whether you're talking about the, the Jesus of Mormonism, who is just one God out of millions of gods in the universe, a, a man who evolved to become a God, or whether you're talking about the Jesus of the Jehovah's Witnesses, who, who say Jesus was the first creation of God, the Archangel Michael, or whether you're talking about the Jesus of the New Age movement, where, where Jesus is just a consciousness, a Christ consciousness that all of us can develop and grow spiritually into the Christ ourselves. The world is full of counterfeit Jesuses, counterfeit gospels. And this reality isn't unique to our day and age. Counterfeit gospels and false Jesus Christ have been a threat to genuine biblical Christianity from the very beginning of the faith. We're going to see that this summer as we turn to the book of 1 John. See, John in his letter to the church uh, First John, as we know it today, is really going to be addressing the reality of false Christ, false gospels that had come into the church, and we're, we're threatening the church with, with these new false teachings. And so as we study the book of First John this, this summer, looking at walking in light and love, much of what John has to share to us is a response to these counterfeits that were seeking to lead the early church astray. Some of the background of 1 John that's really important for us to understand as we begin the series. John obviously wrote uh, the book of 1 John. He wrote it from the city of Ephesus. And if you remember, Ephesus was one of the churches that was founded by the Apostle Paul roughly 30 years earlier. Paul had founded the church of Ephesus, and now here is John pastoring the church in Ephesus, and he has a concern for these second and third generation Christians living in Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey. John at this point in his life was the last of the living apostles. He was the last of Jesus' inner circle, those 12 disciples who, who witnessed Jesus with their own eyes, who, who lived among Jesus and, and saw Jesus and experienced Jesus personally, who, who saw him die and rise from the grave and ascend into heaven. John is the last of these witnesses. And so John's heart as the pastor of the church, his heart holding the responsibility of being the last living apostle is to make sure that he passes on faithfully the truths of Christianity that this new generation of Christians needs to hear. You see, the church was in a very precarious point at this time in its life. We're at the end of the first century. We're basically 50 years after the time of Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension. 50 years has gone by, and now most of those first-generation Christians had either passed away or were in their, their late stages of life. And, and most of the church now was made up of second and even third-generation Christians who themselves weren't eyewitnesses to the life of Christ. 
They weren't eyewitnesses to the resurrection. They didn't experience those miraculous days that we studied in the book of Acts of Pentecost and, and those outpourings of the Spirit. These were second and third generation Christians John is writing to. People much like you and I who, who hear the testimony of the gospel by the, from the witness of others, but we receive it by faith because we weren't there to witness it with our own eyes. And so John knows that he's writing to these second and third generation Christians who are really struggling at this point with the false teaching that has come into the church. And these second and third generation Christians are now beginning to question, do we really want to follow Christianity as, as taught to us by our parents and our grandparents. Maybe they didn't get the right story. Maybe these new teachers who claim to have different gospels and different teachings, maybe these new teachers are, are really telling us the truth about who Jesus was. And so the church at this time, 85, 90 AD, 50 years after Jesus was being divided by this growing false teaching, which we today would label the, the term Gnosticism. John is writing as a response to the Gnosticism growing in the early church. Now understand, this Gnosticism was what I would call a pseudo-Christian cult. And, and what I mean by that is they claimed to be Christian. They, they talked about Jesus. They said they believed in Jesus. And, and they attended the churches with the other Christians. Everything about them looked like Christianity except the Jesus they professed and the gospel they professed was very different from historical, orthodox, biblical Christianity. And so John is going to write his letter as a response to this Gnosticism. Now we shouldn't be surprised by this growing cult at this time in the early church because Paul who planted the church in Ephesus, warned the leaders of Ephesus 30 years earlier to be on alert, to be on guard for false teachers who would come. In Acts 20, 28 through 30, Paul said to the elders of Ephesus, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. And now here we are 30 years later, 85, 90 AD, and this new rapidly growing movement of Gnosticism is drawing away disciples from the ranks of these second and third generation Christians. See, John was concerned about the next generation, friends. That's why he wrote this letter. Understand this this morning. Do you know that the most important generation in the church today? The most important generation here in the church today? I'm sorry to tell you this, but it's not you 50, 60, 70 year olds out there. You're not the most important generation. The most important generation in the church today is the next generation. It's the next generation. And John knew that. And so he wrote this letter with a heart to reach these second and third generation Christians who were teetering on the brink of apostasy as these new false teachings were coming in and influencing the church. John wanted to guard the truth of the faith to protect the next generation of Christians. So what was this Gnosticism that John is responding to? The, the word Gnosticism comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. And these Gnostics, they taught that the way of salvation was through secret knowledge, secret rituals. And so you would be initiated into this group, and then you would progress through different layers where you would gain and learn new information, new secrets. And as you progress through these secret layers, you would grow spiritually. This, this was the belief of Gnosticism. It's not unlike many of the cults in our world today that talk about different layers and levels that you need to achieve and attain in order to discover new and secret knowledge. Gnosticism taught that matter is evil and the spirit is good. In other words, the physical world around us is evil. Only the spirit and the spiritual realm is good. And as a consequence of this belief, the Gnostics taught that our bodies are evil. The, the physical material body that we, reside, that we live in, the body is evil, but the spirit inside is good. They, they described it like a seed planted in a pot of dirty soil. We have a seed within us, a spark of life, a spirit within us that's good, but the body that we're embedded in is evil. 
And so the goal of Gnosticism was about growing spiritually while you would purge the influence of the body that your spirit resided in. And as a result of this, Gnosticism gave rise to two unbiblical lifestyles. People took this Gnostic vision and they went in two different courses with it. And John's going to respond to these in his letter. Some of This is all important background information for what we're going to study throughout the summer. One of the ways people responded to this Gnosticism was to embrace asceticism. And asceticism is the idea that we need to suppress our physical desires. We need to suppress our worldly passions. And in suppressing them through rigid self-discipline, then we can grow spiritually. That, that view is not unlike what, what is present in modern-day Buddhism, for example. Buddhism teaches that the world around us is an illusion and our problem in life, the reason why we suffer in life is because we're attached to this physical world, which doesn't really exist. It's an illusion. And so one of the ways that we transcend this world of illusion is by suppressing our physical desires, by renouncing our physical desires. That's asceticism. It's been around for thousands of years. Other people embrace this Gnostic worldview and move towards the path of licentiousness. And the path of licentiousness said this, look it, if the body's bad and the spirit's good, then it doesn't really matter what I do physically with the body because all that really matters is the spirit within me. And so if I want to go out and party and sleep around and drink, whatever it is, look it, it doesn't matter physically what I do. I can indulge in all the physical passions that I want because all that really matters is the spirit within me. People sometimes ask, well, Jason, why are we bothering to study Gnosticism today? I mean, 2,000 years later, is this, is this even still around anymore? Does anybody care? Friends, understand this. Gnosticism is still very much alive and well today. And it's very much alive and well in the church today. Gnosticism is alive and well here at Lakes Free today. It's just that most people who are practical Gnostics don't recognize the Gnosticism that they've embraced. They don't call it for what it is. See, how, how is Gnosticism alive and well today? Well, friends, let me ask you a question. Have you ever justified your sin by thinking to yourself, oh, it doesn't matter what I do with my body because spiritually I've been cleansed, I've, I've been forgiven, I'm a new creation in Christ. It doesn't matter how I live. It doesn't matter if I willfully disobey God's commands for my life. I can go out and do all that. I can party. I can drink. I can sleep around. Because I just know I can just go back to God and he'll forgive me again spiritually. Friends, that's Gnosticism. It's a 2,000-year-old cult and it's still present in the church today. We just don't recognize it for what it is. And John is going to confront that kind of misguided thinking head on in his letter. He's going to confront this Gnosticism that still so many of us today fall into without even knowing it. It's not just the unbiblical lifestyles that Gnosticism leads to, but it also uh, gives rise to two distinct doctrinal heresies with huge implications for the church. The, the first heresy that Gnosticism leads to is what is called Docetism. Docetism is the belief that Jesus was just a spirit and only appeared in bodily form. Now, why would the Gnostics say this? Well, again, remember, matter is evil. The body is evil. And God would never take on physical form because physical form, matter, is evil. So Jesus couldn't have really been a human being because God, who is spirit, would never lower himself to take on evil human flesh. So when Jesus came into the world, he only appeared to be human, but he wasn't really human. He was really just a spirit. The Gnostics actually taught that when Jesus walked, he didn't leave any footprints behind him because he didn't have a physical body. He just appeared to be in bodily form, but he was really a spirit. Now, now the other heresy that Gnosticism gives rise to is what is called Serinthianism. Serinthianism was taught by a teacher, a false teacher in John's day named Serinthus. And Serinthus taught that just the opposite of docetism. Serinthus taught that Jesus was fully human. He was just a man. But he was granted temporary divine status. How did that work? Well, when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, the Spirit came upon Jesus. 
and Jesus had the Holy Spirit within him right up to the point where he was crucified and the Spirit left him at the crucifixion because the Spirit would never have anything to do with something so evil and bad as death and suffering. And so Jesus was born a man, he ministered as a man empowered by the Holy Spirit, but then he died as an average ordinary human being. Now friends, you gotta understand this. When John is responding to some of these doctrinal errors in our letter this summer, he is directly responding to these false views of Jesus Christ. And these two views are a direct assault on two of the most foundational doctrines of the Christian faith. The incarnation, which teaches that Jesus was both fully God and fully man. Okay, he wasn't half God and half man. He was fully God and fully man at the same time. And the reason why that's important is because the substitutionary atonement. That act which gives all of us freedom from our sin. When Jesus died on the cross. Friends, if Jesus died on the cross as a mere man, okay, as a mere man, who cares if he died on the cross? Hundreds, thousands of people died on the cross. A mere man dying on the cross does nothing for me. But a God-man, a God-man who was fully God and fully human, who was the appropriate substitute for me as a man, but being divine had the power to destroy and eradicate all of my sin, your sin, all sin throughout all of history, that man has power. But you see, when you attack either the divinity or the humanity of Jesus, as the Gnostics were doing, it leads to huge errors. And so John is responding to these challenges to the Christian faith. We're going to find in our study this summer that John is really going to con confront four key threats to the church. The, the first threat to the church that John confronts is cultural accommodation where the church in John's day was, was being tempted to adopt the cultural beliefs and values around them. Many of these second and third generation Christians were starting to question, is it really worth following this Jesus guy? I mean, this is hard, right? I mean, Jesus says, take up your cross. And, and, and we're so different from all of our friends and the world around us. I mean, if we, just, if we just embrace that Gnosticism stuff that all of our friends embrace, life would be so much easier, and, and, and people wouldn't disparage us, and they wouldn't look down on us, and, and we'd look like everybody else in the world. And so there was this pressure, this temptation to give in to the cultural views and norms and values around them. But it's not just the cultural accommodation, it was the false Christology that they were embracing that John responds to. Historically inaccurate and heretical views of Jesus. And John's going to confront the lapsed morality that was present in the church. The, the willful disobedience to God's moral standards for our lives. Many of these Christians were embracing that Gnostic view. Look at it, it doesn't matter what I do in the flesh. It doesn't matter what I do in the body. I can live my life any way I please because all that matters is the spirit. And so John's going to confront that here in his letter. Disunity, the church was being fractured and divided by these false teachers. The church was being split, brothers and sisters going different directions, disassociating with each other, disfellowshipping with each other because of these questions about what was really truth. Friends, isn't it interesting today that the enemy is still seeking to attack the church in these very same ways? 2,000 years later, nothing's changed, friends. We still see the enemy attacking the church by trying to get us to succumb to cultural accommodation, buying into the norms and values of the culture around us. We, we see the enemy attacking the church with, with false views of Jesus Christ, false teachings, heresy. We see the church struggling with, with morality, living obediently to God's norms and standards for our lives. We, we see the church today being fractured. Disunity is a huge problem in the church today whether it's racial disunity or political disunity, there's so much division in the church today, fracturing God's people. What we're gonna see over the course of the summer is that this book of 1 John is really an extremely relevant and practical book for us as 21st century Christians. So many of these issues are issues that we still wrestle with today. 
Now, in responding to these various threats against the church, what we're going to find is that John's strategy will be to point these early Christians back to the foundational truths of the Christian faith. You see, if you don't get the foundation right, friends, nothing else matters. And John understood that. And so he's going to point us back to the foundation, the essential truths of the Christian faith. The, the famous coach of the Green Bay Packers, Vince Lombardi, he had a famous speech that he used to start every training camp with. Every summer in training camp, he would go into the locker room filled with, with all pro players, Hall of Fame players, guys like Bart Starr, who just passed away this past week. Hall of Famers, some of the greatest players in history. And Vince Lombardi would start training camp with the same speech every year. He would hold up a football, and he would say to his team, gentlemen, this is a football. What? The, the, the greatest coach ever, the, the, the guy the Super Bowl's named after, that's how he would start training camp? This is a football? We're talking to Bart Starr and Paul Horning and Ray Nitschke, I mean, some of the legends of the, of the game. But you see, what Vince Lombardi understood is if you don't get the fundamentals right, if you don't get the basics right, you're not going to be able to get anything else right. Nothing else matters if you don't know the essentials. And you see, John understood the same thing. John wants the church to know, to, and, and he wants them to hold fast to these foundational beliefs and the foundational practices of true Christianity that were taught by Jesus and passed down by the apostles. And when it comes to the foundational beliefs of the Christian faith, friends, there is nothing more crucial than the person and work of Jesus Christ. He's the cornerstone. Okay, if you get Jesus wrong, you're going to get the whole foundation. The rest of the structure is going to fall apart. Jesus is the cornerstone. And so John begins by pointing us to the truth of who Jesus Christ is. In our passage this morning, we're going to look at four fundamental truths about Jesus Christ. And this passage really serves as the prologue to the rest of John's letter. John is going to elaborate on these truths as we go through, but, but I want to highlight for us briefly these four truths about Jesus. We're going to look at four verses this morning, 1 John 1, verses 1 through 4. Now, I know what you're thinking, four verses? What? Are you kidding, just four verses? I mean, we've been going through 40 verses in the book of Acts the last couple months. But friends, don't worry, I'm a trained professional, okay? I, I can preach for 40 minutes on four verses just like I can on 40. All right, so uh, buckle in and hold on because, I, I, no, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to go. But we're going to look at 1 John verses 1 through 4 this morning and look at four fundamental truths that we find here about Jesus Christ. You can follow along as I read on the screens behind me. By the way, we're going to be using the New American Standard Version this summer. Uh, as you know, we've been looking at a variety of Bible translations this year. We have uh, just finished the ESV, the English Standard Version, in our study in the book of Acts. Over the course of the summer, we're going to be looking at the NASB, the New American Standard Bible, uh, during our study of 1 John. So you can grab a copy of that. You can look it up online in your Bible app. But uh, that's what we're going to be using this summer. So John begins his letter. What was from the beginning? What we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. Here in the opening to John's letter, he highlights four fundamental truths about Jesus. The, the first thing that John tells us here is that Jesus is the God who was from eternity. He was from eternity. One of John's favorite terms that he regularly employs to describe Jesus Christ is the term, the word. He uses it here in his letter. He also uses it in the gospel of John. In fact, he opens his gospel, John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. 
Now, John uses this term, the word, in reference to Jesus here in the Gospel of John, but also in the letter of 1 John. And it's an interesting term that John uses because John is writing primarily to a Greek audience, people coming out of a Greco-Roman cultural background. And so when John used the term word in reference to Jesus Christ, his Greek audience would have understood that to mean something very specific. You see, in the Greek culture, the term word came from the Greek word logos. And the logos, according to Greek philosophy, was the life-empowering force that was behind the entire universe. Everything in the universe, everything that existed, all life came from this logos, this life-empowering force. But you see, in Greek philosophy, they didn't know who or what the Logos was. And so the Greek philosophers never identified the Logos. They believed that there was some force behind the universe, but they didn't know who that force was. And so John here begins his gospel, and he begins his letter of 1 John by affirming the truth that Jesus, who has come in flesh, is the Word, the Logos, that life-empowering force that all of you believe in, that's Jesus. He was God from the very beginning. He was God from all of eternity. Jesus was the Logos. And it's interesting to note that John says that the word was from the beginning, not is from the beginning. Friends, there's a huge difference in that, right? If the word, was, if the word is from the beginning, then that could mean that the word was created in the beginning, And from that point forward, the word is. But that's not what John says. John says the word was from the beginning. In other words, the word was there at the beginning. At the beginning of what? At the beginning of the universe. At the beginning of creation. The word was. Jesus was. And John is saying that Jesus is the God who was from all of eternity. Friends, you can go back in history as far back into eternity past as you can go and you will find Jesus there. You can go as far into eternity future as you can go and you will find Jesus there because Jesus is the God who exists from all eternity and for all eternity. Some of you parents, you have little kids and you've probably been asked this question that my son Caleb asked me recently. Dad, who made God? Your kids ever ask you that question, who made God, right? I mean, it's it just common sense, right? I mean, we know that anything that comes into existence has to have something or someone that brings it into existence, right? So, so who made God? And friends, the answer to that question is no one. God is and was and always will be. God is eternal. He's timeless. He's limitless. Jesus is that God who was from all eternity. Jesus himself made this claim. When the Pharisees asked Jesus, who are you? In John 8, 58, Jesus said to the Pharisees, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. I am. In other words, Jesus is taking the name for God that God gave to Moses thousands of years earlier. Remember when God chose Moses to go and deliver the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt, Moses says, well, Lord, if somebody should ask me who sent me, who do I tell them sent me? And God said to Moses, you tell them, I am has sent you. And so when Jesus declares himself to be I am, one of the reasons the Jews got so upset with Jesus is because he was applying the eternal Godhead and the terminology of the eternal Godhead to himself. Jesus is saying, look at 2,000 years ago when Abraham was around, even before Abraham was born, I am. Jesus was the God who existed from eternity. John secondly declares in our passage this morning that Jesus is the God who took on humanity. One of my father's favorite stories, my dad was a Christian apologist and evangelist, and one of his favorite stories that he used to tell was about a father and a son who were walking down a dirt path, and they came across an anthill that somebody had stepped on and smashed. 
And, and this little boy walking with his dad, he, he saw all these ants, you know, scurrying around and wounded and, and, and laying there hurt. And the little boy looked up at his dad and said, Daddy, wouldn't it be great if we could go down and tell those ants that we love them? Tell those ants that we care about them? Help them with their sick and their wounded? And the father, he looked down at his little boy and he said, son, the, the only way that we could go down and tell those ants that we love them is if we ourselves could become ants. And if we could go and live like the ants and talk like the ants by our lives, they would know what we are like. And you know something, friends, 2,000 years ago, God looked down upon a world that he had made, a world that he loved, and he saw us in our suffering, he saw us in our rebellion, he saw us lost in our disobedience. And God said, I want to tell you how much I love you. And how is God going to do that? God said, I will become a man. And I will live like a man and talk like a man. And by my life, they will know what I am like and how much I love them. And the Apostle John here in his letter tells us that the word was manifested. In John chapter 1 verse 14 in his gospel, John says that the word Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us. We saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John says that the word, God who is spirit, manifested himself to us in the person of Jesus Christ. And John's testimony here in the first four verses of the letter of 1 John is that we, the disciples, we heard him. We heard him with our ears. We had lived with him for three years. We heard him teach. He says that we had seen him. We saw him with our own eyes. John says, him who we looked at. The term looked at here is an interesting word. In the Greek, the word looked at is theomai. It means to gaze intently upon something. This is the word where we get our English word theater from. Friends, what do you do when you go to the theater? Do you just give a passing glance at the actors on the stage? No, you gaze at them. You look intently upon them. Your focus is on them for two, three hours. Why? Because that's the show. And John uses the same word in reference to their view of Christ. We looked at him. Theomai, we saw him with our own eyes. John says, we touched him. When did they touch him? Friends, remember after Jesus' resurrection, Jesus appeared to the disciples in the upper room. Luke 24, 39 through 40 tells us that when Jesus appeared to his disciples, he said, see my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. Go ahead, touch me. For a spirit doesn't have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Friends, John is responding to Gnosticism here. He's responding to those false teachers who said, no, Jesus was just a ghost. He was just a spirit. Why does John include this in his gospel? Why does he say in his letter, we touched him? It's because people were buying into this lie that Jesus was just a ghost, just a spirit. And John is saying, no, that's not the truth. I was there. We saw him. We heard him. We touched him. This is the real deal. This isn't a made-up story. This is the truth. And why did God manifest himself to us like this? Why did the word take on human flesh? Well, John tells us here in verse 2, it was to reveal to us eternal life. And this leads me to point number three this morning. Jesus is the God who invites us into fellowship. Friends, fellowship is much more than sipping coffee out of a styrofoam cup up in your ABF classroom. Fellowship is much more than a potluck downstairs in the fellowship hall. Fellowship, according to biblical Christianity, is something far deeper. In fact, the Greek word for fellowship is koinonia, and it implies a deep sharing of things in common. This is the fellowship that God invites us to through Jesus Christ, a deep relational sharing of things in common. And John tells us here in chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, that there is both a vertical and horizontal element to our fellowship as Christians. See, John says that vertically, we were made for a relationship with our creator. That's why God made us, to fellowship with him. 
Jesus said the same thing. Passages like John 10, 10, Jesus says the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. That's Satan he's talking about. But then he says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Friends, that's why the word came in and became flesh because he wanted to help us understand how we could have fellowship with the Father, how we could have life abundantly. That was Jesus' goal for us. God created us to know and experience life abundant in fellowship with him. The early church father, Augustine, once said, our heart is restless until it rests in you. Friends, you'll never have abundant life unless your heart is resting in fellowship with your creator, God. That's where true fellowship is found. But John goes on and he says that our vertical fellowship with the Father actually ushers us into a horizontal fellowship with other Christians through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit within each of us. See, because of what Christ has done for us, I not only have fellowship with God, but now I have fellowship with every brother and sister in Christ because the Spirit of God who lives in me is alive in them. And so Don here, for example, is a follower of Christ and he has the spirit in him. I have the spirit in me and he loves Jesus and I love Jesus. And as we both grow in our relationship with Jesus together, we're growing closer to Christ. But in doing that, we grow closer to one another. It's like a triangle, friends. And that's the reality for every Christian in this room this morning. It's the reality for brothers and sisters around the world. When you're walking in fellowship with Jesus, it inevitably leads you to have fellowship with one another because the same Jesus alive in me is alive in them. And as we grow closer to Jesus, we'll grow closer to one another. Friends, please understand this this morning. You can find a church that's correct in all of its doctrine. You can find a church full of people engaged in Bible studies. But if that church isn't marked by genuine fellowship, all the rest is just empty religion. It's like biting into a chocolate Easter bunny and finding that the middle is nothing but hollow, right? Isn't that a bummer, right? You bite in your Easter bunny and it's hollow inside. Friends, that's what John's talking about. You can have right doctrine. You can have great Bible study classes. But if you don't have fellowship, it's all hollow. And so God ushers us into true fellowship through Jesus Christ. And this only happens when we fall in love with Jesus. And as we fall in love with Jesus, we grow deeper in love with Jesus. We'll inevitably grow deeper in fellowship and love for others. Fourthly, this morning, John says that Jesus is the God who ushers us into joy. John says at the end of verse 4, I write these things so that our joy may be made complete. Who's John talking about here when he says our joy? John's talking about his joy. He's talking about their joy. He's talking about our joy. John's writing these things so that all of our joy can be complete. See, John understands that true joy is only found in a relationship with Jesus. And so John wants his joy to be complete by seeing their joy and our joy made complete. And how is that made complete? It's made complete in a relationship with Jesus. That's John's desire. He wants us to know real joy. And friends, please know Christian joy is far more significant than mere happiness. So many people in our world are looking for happiness. But Christian joy is something so much better than just happiness. Christian joy is a deep and abiding peace and contentment and hope that comes when you're living in fellowship with the Heavenly Father. We find this joy, the the psalmist tells us in Psalm 1611, you will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forever. See, what the Apostle John had experienced and what he wants us to know is that the path of life is Jesus. And in his presence is life abundant and his promises are for eternity. Friends, if you don't know Jesus and if he is not number one in your life, you're never going to know true joy because he's the source of joy. The 19th century Scottish minister Robert Rainey once said, the banner of joy will only fly over the castle of your life when the king is in residence there. 
You'll never know true joy until the king is in residence in your heart. See, do you have real joy in your life today? If you don't, it's probably because you got the wrong person sitting on the throne of your heart. Friends, understand this morning, real joy will never be found in more stuff or a bigger bank account or a better sex life or a different spouse. Real joy is only found in a relationship with Jesus Christ. A relationship where he is number one and you are second. And I'll tell you something, friends, if you're willing to humble yourself under the lordship of Jesus, there is where you'll find true joy. This past December, we did a teaching series here at Lakes Free called Carols for the King. We looked at a great Christmas carol, one of our favorites, Joy to the World. Joy to the World. Why? Because the Lord is come. Joy to the world. The Lord is come. You know, friends, something I never understood is why as Christians, why do we only celebrate Christmas on December 25th? You know, as Christians, we should have Christmas every single day of the year. Did you know you can have Christmas in June? Some of you young people are thinking, that's not a bad idea. Hey, Mom and Dad, let's have Christmas this afternoon. Go ahead and do it. Have Christmas today. Celebrate Christmas. Why? Joy to the world because the Lord has come. Joy has come. Fellowship with God has come. God from all of eternity has come so that we could know him and know life abundantly. Let's close in prayer together. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this opening passage in the book of 1 John. And Lord, we're anxious to see how you're going to speak to us this summer. We just commit our lives to you this summer, Lord, and we ask that where we need challenging, Lord, that you would challenge us. Where we need encouragement, you would encourage us. Where we need a gentle push, that you would push us. And that you would make our spirits and our hearts receptive to your truth. We thank you, God, for the, the words that you inspired John to share. And we pray, Lord, that you would use these words in a powerful, transformative way in all of our hearts. Lord, may we know true joy. May we know true fellowship. May we know life abundantly as we seek to walk faithfully with you, walking in light and love. God, we're grateful for these truths. And we commit our lives to you, asking that you would use us as your people and that you would draw us into a deeper, more intimate, more loving relationship with you. We commit this to you now, Lord, our lives to you. In Jesus' name, amen.